Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. All right, well, we're back on with another episode of Long Range Pursuit Podcast. It's uh, middle tail end of hunting season. We've got some hunts behind us, probably still still few to go in the season. And uh, I kind of wanted to talk about bipods. Uh, I got Ben on. Ben, I think you've been on once or twice before. Yeah, you? yep. Ben, maybe introduce yourself just a little bit real quick. Yeah, my name's Ben Titus, and uh, I work in the creative and marketing side. So um, still try to do a lot of hunting and, uh, yeah, try to get out as much as anybody else. But, um, yeah, I no, don't know what else to say. You've had a good season this so yeah. far. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, I drew the I drew the tag everybody wants, right? I uh, Somebody had to get lucky. So, yeah, I had that sheep hunt, and you were on – uh, on it with me and over here just outside of Cody. So yeah, that was, that was a good time that, I mean, you know, for us, they can't draw tags like that. I guess I, I, I can't, I can't speak too much. We're both pretty <laughs> lucky. Yeah. Both pretty lucky, yeah. but, uh, sometimes you got to live vicariously through, through others. So that was pretty cool to yeah. be able to be a part of that hunt. Yeah, it was a good hunt. And, uh, we, uh, I guess maybe a good segue into the bipod podcast is I use the bipod exactly how you know, fully maxed out function on it and, uh, just in that steep country and, yeah. um, glad I had it and didn't, uh, have, have, was, wasn't relying on a tripod or something else in that particular situation. Sure. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. The sheep hunt was good. I think I'll, uh, maybe try to get out for the last couple of days in general deer season. Yeah. So. Yeah. We're, we've got some weather coming in tomorrow, tonight. I'm kind of hoping maybe get out and catch just a little bit of migration going on here. Yeah, I hope they come down. That's how it happened for me last year. We needed the snow. They're moving. They're starting to move from what I'm hearing. So, well, let's dive into uh, bipod stuff. Um, Trying to figure out where where we really want to start here. I think biggest thing is, you know, Gunworks, we've been around for a long time. We've sold a lot of rifles and we've sell a lot of rifles with bipods for a good, good reason. I I look at bipods and as, in my opinion, one of the most important tools I can have in in the field. And I guess realistically, you could probably say that about just about everything, right? Yeah. To my my puffy code and a good rifle scope and trekking poles. I mean, all this other stuff. But as far as when it comes down to being able to execute a good shot in the field, to me, you can't leave home without a bipod. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys shooting off a tripod these days. It's the old shoot off the backpack or find a rock or a log kind of thing. But in, especially as we've started to kind of extend some of our ranges over the years and, you know, get into these more long range capable rifles and cartridges and, and high BC bullets and whatever else, you know, being able to go from that traditional 200 yards on a pie plate kind of shooting to being able to extend your range past that, I think a bipod is absolutely being able to get prone and shoot uh, from a stable position is absolutely essential. It doesn't matter how good your rifle is. Doesn't matter if your rifle shoots, you know, one minute groups or quarter minute groups. If you can't get stable, it it's you're wasting your time. Yeah, and there's a lot of ways to get stable. I mean, there are a lot of ways Lots to get ways, stable, right. and you know, it's uh, we see it all the time with the NRL hunter and everything. It's like forcing yourself into positions that maybe you wouldn't necessarily be sure you'd like you got you got to shoot between this pole and this pole but what about over there 10 yards where you yeah. can get on a flat spot right. you know um but the reality is is that on a bipod you're going to be as stable as you will ever be i mean that's as stable as you can get so why wouldn't you try yeah. to use the bipod um you can do it a lot of different ways but most of our practice most of our validation like you spend most of your time on the range on a bipod. So yeah. I'm with you. Like, I really want to have one, and I prefer to have one um, yeah. whenever I can. So You know, even you look at, like, uh, our LRU classes, and we do a, a, a decent amount of bench shooting, but we really do that to kind of establish a baseline, and then we really try to get prone as much as we can. Um, and because that is a much more realistic field shooting scenario, you very rarely going to have a bench set up uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in in the field. Um, so I kind of look at it like, you know, 
I'm I'm going hunting bipod bipod prone. Shoot. Taking a prone shot is is my first choice across the board, pretty much. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's always going to be that extenuating circumstances, awkward positions, a quick offhand shot, whatever else. But uh, if I have the choice, I'm I'm always going prone as my first order of operations kind of thing. Yeah, if that makes sense. Um, you know, and I even see I'm I'm maybe a little bit of the outlier in the precision shooting community. I I feel like a lot of guys are, you see a lot of guys starting to use tripods to shoot, and it's it's an absolutely invaluable tool. But I think personally, a lot of guys are starting to overutilize that, and I, I don't know, maybe getting a little bit lazy and then thinking, well, I'm just going to shoot this off a tripod versus there's a perfectly good prone prone position right mm-hmm. there. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit, I'm probably that guy, like, I'll go shoot these NRL matches where I'll shoot half the stage prone, and I'll figure out a way. <laughs> You've seen me. You've yeah. shot, we've shot yeah. together, right? It's like I'm shooting all sorts of weird, awkward, where it's probably, I'm, I'm taking probably a little bit too far on the other side where maybe some of those would be a lot better just with a, with a good tripod yeah. shot. But, you know, to me, I've only recently started carrying a tripod to shoot off of hunting um and even then it's usually a pretty minimalist setup and i I, i'll tell you if you're creative enough there's almost always a way to get uh to get prone um in the years that i've hunted this year is the first time i've ever killed an animal off of a tripod what was it it was an antelope oh here yeah i just saw that that was a pretty nice buck wasn't it yeah yeah, good good buck it wasn't the buck i was after you know there's always a bigger one out there right and and i i shot him thinking it was a it was a bigger uh bigger antelope but you know that was one of those classic scenarios and i can think back of instances where i could have and should have gotten uh, you know a tripod would have been beneficial um but that was one of those really long slow curving open slopes Mm -hmm. where you just you just can't get prone and you know you get two feet off the ground, three feet off the ground, and you can see a thousand yards, but laying down, there's just enough curvature on the ground that you can't. I'd have to belly crawl 200 more yards to get to a prone mm-hmm. position to shoot that that antelope. So perfect, perfect scenario, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think the tripods have their place, right? Yeah. And I'm already going to pack them. I already have one. I'm going to- Always got one. Might as well make it ARCA. Got one for the spar- mm-hmm. for the spotter. If I have it for the spotter, I'm going to put my binos on it. Yeah. And then why not put your gun on it? Sure. But, um, again, it comes back to what's the most stable position we can get. And I can see, I didn't, I didn't leave the bipod on the sheep hunt. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, I got to I got to come out and say it that I, I missed that sheep off the tripod. Right. <laughs> And I don't know that it, I don't know that it was, it was because of the tripod, right? I, uh, I, I think it was just a bad wind call, but yeah. Which, um, which <laughs> I'm no, one to blame on that. <laughs> no, I mean, I can, I can dive into why I missed the sheep, but <laughs> it wasn't, it was it probably wasn't because of the tripod versus the bipod. But, uh, as it turns out, I would have been more comfortable mm-hmm. if I had known about that spot that was another just, spot. Yeah, it was a hundred yards was a mis- over miscommunication, right? Well, it's like you know, I I think I think I had. We don't need to go all the way into the de- details, but I think I'd ma- maybe mentioned it to Jake, but maybe I thought I'd said it to you, but not. I heard that there was a nice spot that was so you relatively flat, but I know I hadn't been over there. I hadn't and been there over were, there, and then the sheep. This came is out. sheep country. There aren't flat no, spots. No, there aren't. A plenty, right? There was one on yeah. the whole. Yeah, and it was again a maxed out bipod situation. Yeah. But. Anyway, I, I I took the shot off the tripod, but it, I wasn't packing the tripod to shoot off of sure. necessarily. I knew that it was going to be a possibility. Yeah. Um. But I I tend to shoot a little bit high off mm-hmm. of a tripod. Sure. And I can tell you that in that situation, the last thing going through my head was I might shoot a little bit high off the tripod. Yeah. If I was to just get prone with the bipod. Yeah, I don't. I don't have to think about that. Sure. You know, sure. it's like most of our practice is yeah. on the ground off the bipod. So, yeah. um, no, but it, it's just different mentalities, and and this is not a, uh, you know, should should have would have could have thing. But you know, I think about it, it was interesting watching you set up for that shot versus how I would have. Oh yeah, I normally would have right. And again, it's like going back to my 
I'm going to get prone no matter what. Mm-hmm. You know, we had several hours sitting waiting for these sheep to, we, we knew they were on the space. We didn't know where they were. We sat and watched them for a couple hours. Man, I would, I, I would have excavated a freaking 10 foot <laughs> landing <laughs> aircraft yeah. landing pad, you know, to, to, to be able to get prone. Um, that just, just my, you know, just my kind of mentality, I guess. But it was kind of interesting watching you set up. I mean, you, you were, you were confident in that shot and I, you know, I don't think we can necessarily blame it on the, on the tripod. It was just no, it was a bad one. Those things just to, just yeah. to, you know, and we ended up making good, good later on that shot. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and I used the bipod for that, which yeah. I could have, I could have used a tripod, but I think in both of those shot scenarios, um, it come like in a lot of hunting scenarios, it comes down to your, your time management and what you can do comfortably with the time you're given. Yeah. And not knowing where those sheep were when I took the shot off the tripod, the tripod was the quickest solution yeah. for that shot. Had the pack under my arm. Yeah. You know, I know I was solid. I watched, I watched the shot, all that. Um, but the, uh, the bipod, I, I would have been running around trying to find, trying to set my pack up so I could put the bipod on the pack or something. Sure. Like it was the quickest solution. On the, on the shot where I killed it, mm-hmm. the, uh, the tripod would not have worked that well because I would have had to be in, clipped into the tripod, scooting right. out, constantly adjusting the legs as I changed positions. I would have had this big hunk of metal off the front of the gun. It just wouldn't work that well. Yeah. So in that scenario, the bipod worked the out. Bipod worked out um, good. But I think, like for me, that's the first animal I've shot at off a tripod, aside from like coyotes. Um, but normally, I pack a bipod on the gun and a pair of shooting sticks mm-hmm. because the the tripod usually isn't as fast as just getting on shooting sticks. And I'm comfortable on a deer to three or four hundred yards sure. off of sticks. Sure. Um, and if it's any further than that. I want to be on a bipod anyway. Yeah. You know, tripod, shooting sticks, whatever. I still want to be a bi- on a bipod once you start pushing that four or 500 yard mark anyway. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I I think there's a lot of places for everything, but again, I'm with you. I'm in the camp, but like I'm going to try to get prone. Where, where you can. Where I can, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the biggest takeaway, and, you know, we're probably preaching to the choir, but I think there are guys out there that, you know, need to hear it. Just take, take it. Get, you know, whatever it takes to get, if, if you don't have a picked any rail on the front end of your rifle, you know, there's a lot of guys making, uh, bipods that attach a lot of different ways. I mean, obviously we make bipods and we're pretty proud of them, but, uh, I really don't care what you put on your gun. Just, just put one on the gun. Yeah. You know, I see, I see TV show hosts, you know, trying to shoot stuff 400 yards off their pack. And it's like, come on guys, we're, it's, we're, we're past that. You know, if, if we're trying to shoot past that. 200 yard pipe plate kind of thing, then let's, let's get a, get a bipod on it. Yeah. And, and that's the thing for me personally, um, that sheep was the first big game animal I missed. And it's one of the few shots I've taken that hasn't been prone. Yeah. So yeah. again, I don't know. Do you I, I love those two or not? Yeah. And, and again, I don't think that they're necessarily related, but maybe yeah. they are. Maybe, maybe I wasn't as comfortable. And so. Sure. I was more focused on just getting stable rather than calling the wind. Sure. You know, who, who knows? But um, shooting off your pack, shooting off of tripods, shooting off a rock, whatever. Think about how many times you've missed. And was it because of that? Like, yeah. could, would you have made that shot sure. if you had just looked around and tried to find that spot? Sure. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yeah. You never know for sure. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, features you look for in a bipod. You know, there's there's a lot out there. Um, you know, obviously we, you know, the the whole reason we built a bipod, you know, and, and guns are way more sexy, right? You know, the optics, there's a lot of cool uh, stuff that we do, suppressors uh, compared to bipods. But I, it's funny watching how much excitement internally there was as we developed this project and the engineers kind of worked through the iterations of, bringing the Elevate bipod to the market uh, last year. Uh, I think, you know, being able to define and choose all the the features to come up with that perfect bipod for what we do, 
um, I think is what drove so much excitement internally about that product. And I think it shows how, it kind of reiterates how important that, that product is uh, for long range shooting. So what, what are your thoughts? I mean, what do you look for in a, in a bipod and, and maybe what, what you don't look for, I guess, on top of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll start off by saying that I shot a Harris for a long time. I, I've still I've still got one that I use yeah. actively on a bunch of guns that don't have a pick rail. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. they're they're great. Yeah. They're great. And and I used it way past when bipod started becoming more advanced. Yeah. Um and now that I have other bipods, I, I've started realizing what all I was missing. Sure. I was able to make do, but yeah. what I was missing. So personally being able to attach to a pick rail or a quick mm-hmm. release of some sort, I like a lot. It's mostly a convenience thing. It doesn't really have anything to do with yeah. uh, stability, but mm-hmm. just use your experience. Um, have to have a cant adjustment. I agree. Yeah. Have to have a cant adjustment. Um, forcing yourself to adjust your legs to level your gun. Yeah. Recipe it's, for failure. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um. As far as the uh, the quick release thing goes in the cant, one thing I've noticed on a lot of the uh, pick rail lever lock type mm-hmm. systems, I limit the cant. I end up getting limited on the cant on that one side because the the canting base or that okay. that lever will run into gotcha. one of the legs or something. And sure. so uh, I end up not having the right amount of cant on one side it's like lopsided okay um and on this elevate bipod that isn't a factor with the neo lock sure. so I, I have appreciated that on on this bipod nice and low profile right you don't have the big levers and stuff sticking yeah and that lever action. doesn't yeah it doesn't bind you up when you're yeah like fully fully canned so that's something i noticed um quick release legs yeah be able to quickly adjust um that's one thing um enough height Enough height. Enough height. Yeah. Um, for field application, being able to know that you're able to get over grass. Um, right. And then, I guess, again, for field application, just wait. I mean, yeah. that's always a consideration. Um, usually usually my first thing, right? I mean, you know, I'm kind of just a ultralight nut. Sometimes yeah. it's more out of sport than it is for necessity. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm just a weight weenie. I don't know. But, um, you know... I, I've always kind of made the comment that, you know, we're all building all these titanium action, carbon barrel, short barrel, you know, you're, you'll pay hundreds of dollars to cut, you know, a pound out of your sleep system, you know, buying down bags versus synthetic bags or whatever else. And then we go throw a pound of aluminum and steel on the end of our gun for yeah. iPod. And it's like, man, that's a big sacrifice. So weight's, weight's a big thing for me. And uh, that's definitely been a big driver for me kind of being involved in that development process is keeping that weight down. Yeah. You know, I think the Elevate came in at 12 ounces, which, you know, is pretty dang good, good. for, you know, I think real realistically, if you looked at, there's some great lightweight bipods out there, but I think if you looked at features and stability per weight combined with the height adjustment ability, I don't think there's really much out there that, that competes with that. There's some other good bipods, but usually come with a weight some penalty. Weight, weight penalty or yeah. you know some some other features that yeah. you're, you're missing out i think if i remember right, i think you can get up to 19 inches uh, highest yep. on with the elevate and down to like four and a half inches lowest which a lot of people don't think about being able to get low with a bipod but especially when you're mountain hunting you know i i tend to hunt the tops a lot down into you know canyons mm-hmm. and valleys and be able to get that low, that bipod low, so you don't have to raise the butt end of the rifle so high to pull off a shot is is actually a, a yeah. really important. Feature. So you can stabilize the rear of the rifle exactly. better, right? Right. Uh, so th- that's a big deal. I'm I'm relatively short. You could never do it, but I can actually kind of do a, a sitting shot with that that bipod at max max height. Well, that's you know, actually how I crouched. Yeah. Shot. That's how I shot the sheet. Oh, it is. Yeah. Really. Yeah, that is. Um. So we we come around that little group of trees and yeah. see them down there and it's steep. Right. So when I had, uh, took a step back, got in behind the trees, well, as I, I had to scoot out uh-huh. in order to figure out which sheep was which. And, uh, as I, as I scooted out, I ended up getting some tall grass and that slope was so steep that yeah. there was no way to get prone. Right. And again, with the tripod, 
I was able to like lean back against the ground and kind of shimmy mm -hmm. and then sit back up because I was basically skylined. Yeah. And then I had that bipod on the tallest setting, legs narrowest position. Awesome. Put the bipod feet on my toes. Oh, you did? <laughs> and then I was able to just get high enough to get over the oh, over the grass. And it was, it was 250 yards, so, yeah. you know, plenty stable enough for that shot. But, yeah, yeah. if if I had had any shorter bipod, it never would have worked. worked. I probably would have just had to shoot it freehand, yeah. honestly. That's awesome. See, I, I mean, I wasn't there for the shot, right? I was yeah. there for the hunt. I ended up on the other mountain spotting, you know, uh, watching those sheep while you guys worked in to, to pull the shot off. So I didn't actually see the execution. Yeah. So that's pretty good. Yeah, no, that bipod. It was yeah, nice because at that point it was rock solid and, you know, it's all yeah. good. So. Um, you know, attachment options is, is a big deal. You mentioned the Picatinny and I think, you know, that's where a lot of things are going. Um, all, also seeing a lot of guys uh, moving towards ARCA mounts yeah. lately. You know, that's one thing that we're, we're lacking right now with, with the Elevate, but we are working on that. We'll have that uh, hopefully here in the coming months uh, with an ARCA mount option for, for Gunworks bipods. But um, you know, there's definitely something to be said about having all of your setups one set up one way, um, you know, kind of like I've done with uh, tripods and optics, all of my tripods and optics are arcing out, right? And so your gun, your spotter, your bino, everything fits across the board. There's no, you know, this, this foot goes to that tripod or that foot doesn't go to that tripod or whatever else. Um, so there's certainly something to be said about doing a similar setup with, yeah. with your bipod. It'd be cool to see the, the elevate end up with the Arca pick rail yeah. dual. I know it'd probably be a little too wide for a lot of pick applications. Uh, it's, it's a little bit bulkier, but it, it's, it, it's doable for sure. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we're, the guys are actively working on that. We've got a prototype now and hopefully have, have some stuff out here before too long. Yeah. That'd be cool to see. Guys that are listening. So. Yeah. And I don't know these things either, right? Like, I'm just hearing that for the first time. Too, well, I so. mean, but you're echo echoing what we've been hearing from customers for, for the last year. Right. And, you know, we kind of we kind of knew that going in. You just can't do everything all at once. you got to, you know, a little bit of baby steps to, to get there. So yeah. that is definitely the the next priority on the list. What about you? Anything I listed that you look for? Um, you know, the adjustment, I think, is a big thing. And... Um, I don't know if this is a happy accident or if it's intentional. I guess we could always pretend, but um, it, it's that leg adjustment that's a big deal. And there's, you know, a few guys have done different ways, whether you're pulling or you're releasing a button or you're twist lock to extend legs on a bipod. Um, what I really like about the Elevate is, you know, the twist lock I've never been a, a super in love with because mm -hmm. it, it takes a little bit more time. Um, but I've actually kind of... I've kind of learned to love it using, so the, the, the elevate bipod, if guys haven't handled it, it's got two modes of, of leg extension, right? You've got a twist lock for the upper leg, and then it's got a button with a spring loaded, uh, lower leg. Right. Um, and what I've found is that upper twist lock leg is like my, it's like my course adjustment. So, you know, if I'm hunting an area where I'm at an, and you know, NRL match or something like that, where I think, you know what, I just know that I'm going to need to go long to make this shot. Then before I even get behind the gun, I can extend those legs either all the way or part way. Um, and before I'm even setting the gun on the ground. And then what I'm doing is I use that spring loaded leg. You can, once you're behind the gun, you realize, oh, I need another inch of height or whatever. I can really easily go in and tap that button and do my more fine uh, tuned height adjustments yeah. on there. And so it's kind of a, a bimodal thing that actually works really well once you kind of get it, get the hang of it. Um, another thing that, um, I, I really like, I don't know if you mentioned this, but deploying legs and there's kind of the two schools of thought in deploying legs, either you're locking them closed and you have to hit some kind of a button or a lever to release a leg, you know, from folded to, 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 um, deployed uh, or some kind of a detent that's holding it in place. And I, I really kind of despise the locking legs. Totally. And there, you know, guys have complaints that, you know, you're bushwhacking or whatever and stuff, so, you know, a, a detent leg, it's just kind of held there by pressure. And so it could get 
you know, hit by a branch or something like that and deployed. To me, that's that's a really minor inconvenience versus having a uh, animal lifetime standing there at 300 yards about to go over a hill and you're fumbling trying to get that button unlocked. And everybody says, well, you know, I've used it a thousand times. I know how to do it. Well, I, I'm telling you, I've sat and watched guys fumble with those legs, you know, when it's a high pressure situation, when, you know, your fingers are cold, you got gloves on, whatever else. I'm telling you, be able to just grab that leg and, and tap it down versus have to unlock a, yeah. a button to me is, is absolutely the, the way to go. Yeah. Keep it simple. Yeah. 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 Um, anything else? I'm trying to think. Feature-wise, like a must-have or prefer-to-have on a bipod. For me, not not necessarily. Like you said, there's a few different ways to deploy legs or yeah. um, to extend legs. Um, I agree. That's one thing on the Elevate that I really like is not having to use the button to deploy them. Yeah. Um, I do like the uh, bipods that you can just pull on the leg to extend them. I yeah. think that's there's really convenient. Like that. Yeah. But regardless of loud. that's that's yeah. probably the biggest drawback in my opinion and, and regardless of that once you're behind the gun laying down there's still kind of a pain so having yeah. the spring loaded on the elevate is a nice feature so that yeah. just like you said you just can't the gun up a little bit pop the button and it's it's easy right so right. yeah there's there's different different ways a lot of them are good but the uh the elevates got a good mix yeah. of features for sure I really try to not make these like a shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously we're, you know, we're pretty, pretty happy with what we made, but I think, I think it comes back to, you know, we had the opportunity to design the bipod that we all had dreamed about yeah. for years and we'd use all the other stuff and knew what we liked and did like, and we're able to kind of build that into. Yeah. And if I was to change right. something, I'd probably do a pull adjustment yeah. and have the spring loaded. Yeah. Like personally, yeah. that's. I, I wouldn't disagree with Those would be, that would be too. pretty awesome. Like you said, bimodal things. That would yeah. be maybe one one adjustment, but overall, I haven't used every bipod on the market, right? Sure. But I've used a handful of the most popular ones, and yeah. there's things that are good and bad about all of them. Sure. You know, but sure. anyway, I think, yeah, I think I hit on my top colonies. Yeah. You know, let's talk just real quick about features you don't want or don't need. And I, I think I kind of talked a little bit about the locking legs. That's probably one that I would, I personally prefer to, to avoid. Now I, I still have a couple of bipods that, that are like that, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, you, you recognize that, um, th that is maybe a challenge for, you know, some of those situations. Uh, one that I look at, um, is pan and that's probably a pretty polarizing topics. Probably some guys think they absolutely have to have it. In my mind, I think pan, you know, basically the ability to, to pan left and right when your bi bipod is deployed is generally, in my, my own opinion, um, more detrimental of a feature than an advantage in a, in most bipod designs. I don't know what's your, what's your take? No, I, I could, I can see that. Um, I think you automatically lose a little bit of stability. Mm -hmm. Like you think about when you're canting your bipod and you leave it a little too loose Yeah, and, and it's not not as stable as when it's locked down. Well, inevitably that's going to happen to you again when, when you have another adjustment. Right. Um, and then the other thing I immediately think of is your recoil management. Yeah. As soon as you start panning on that, those bipod legs are going to be moving in a, a different angle than the, the, than the line system. of your bore. Exactly. Yeah. And it's going to force some hops or something. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be detrimental. You know, I, I think it's just, it's one of those things that, that looks and sounds cool, but it's just, it's just not really that practical and not that necessary. Yeah. Um, I think on top of what you talked about, it also just unnecessarily complicates a design. You're having to add entirely extra acts, you know, acts, access of motion into that system, um, that just makes it more complex. It makes it heavier. You got more moving parts that can fail. Um, but I think that is the big thing is, is, you know, generally you want that, that rifle system recoiling straight back. And so, you know, the opportunity for a bipod to get turned off, off axis from your bore is going to introduce all sorts of weird, weird things. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's like anything, there's always an application for that. But I mean, you think about how often 
hunting do you need to be making these big, broad, sweeping, panning motions with a rifle, right? Generally, you've got a stationary animal. You lay down, set your rifle somewhat in line with the animal, and, yeah. and you pull off your shot. You know, you're not having to track this thing 300 yards running across some big open field to to kind of stay on him and, and shoot him. I mean, maybe in PRS where you're shooting movers or something like that, but even then, I've shot him with, with bipods with no no pan because those lakes always have enough flex in them that you have enough degrees of of pan built into that flex of that bipod to be able to move back and forth that you really don't need an actual uh you know uh swivel motion in your in your bipod yeah Yeah, i agree i mean there's very few circumstances where i can see that being useful yeah anyway just just personal opinion but totally something to something to think about uh, spike feet's a big one. So, uh, this week we, we were just launching the new spike feet for the, the elevate. This has been something you guys have been asking for, for a long time. Um, and kind of been in works finally got those out. Um, and so those will, anybody that's bought an elevate bipod or will buy one, those are available as an accessory for you. Um, I think spike feet are again, kind of one of these really polarizing things. Either guys love them or hate them or, you know, absolutely have to have them or don't even know why they'd ever want them what's your what's your opinion there i've never used them really i I mean i've never bought a pair of spike feet to put on yeah any of my bipods yeah um i thought they might be nice like there's i don't know shooting off a barricade or like a spool where sure. you got spikes digging into the wood like yeah. something like that um i've never really felt like i was missing them yeah which I know we just released them, but but and half you're you're not wrong. Yeah, you're and not wrong. and half of the reason why I don't like them is I don't even know if I'm gonna get myself into trouble here, but <laughs> like shooting off the top of my pickup or yeah. something. Yeah. Like I don't want to have to worry about it. Up your hood. Yeah, I don't want to. And and even that's like even target shooting, right? Like you you or you're out driving out in a field and a coyote runs off, and that's like hop on top of the truck and, you know, try to shoot it. Something yeah. like that. I don't want to have to worry yeah. about scratching up my paint or putting holes in my cap. Absolutely. You know, like. You're right. So just some personal considerations. But I'm I'm pretty much in line with you. Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things I think spike feet are a very, very niche application where there's some very specific situations where they, they can be pretty beneficial. But um you know, even being kind of the guy behind driving, getting these developed and getting them launched, um, I'm going to tell guys 90% of the time you don't need spike feet. Um, and and I guess what, what I'm trying to say is just know why you want them before you buy them. Yeah. Don't, don't think that they're necessarily better just because they're an upgrade or an accessory. Uh, if you are hunting in certain situations where they're, they're necessary or advantageous, by all means, go forward, or if that's your preference because you've shot both and you like them that way, great. But um, they are not necessarily the the end all be all uh, thing, right? the The way we designed the rubber, they're kind of like big UFO shaped rubber feet on the, that are the stock, stock foot, foot yeah. on the on the elevate. Those are those feet are awesome. They're big, they're wide, um, with the splay which actually we didn't talk about splay on features but oh yeah splay is pretty dang it we, we, we talked about the ability to go low yeah let's do th- but we, we can't we can't skip the splay so we'll yeah. talk about that real quick but um th- that's that's one of those things that not every bipod has right but the ability to go low again and you know they also is are what contribute to being able to get really high um uh, with that bipod but you know, there's a number of bipods out here, and here's another feature that you don't want is that kind of 45 degree forward oh. canted leg that guys use. And they're basically they're using that to be able to give you that pseudo low position on a bipod. But when those legs are canted at an angle, either forward or backward, they're they're doing all sorts of weird things to how your rifle recoils, and you're going to get muzzle rise and and jump. You're not going to be able to spot impacts and get back on on target as well. Um, we'll talk about loading bipods later. Maybe that's a segue into that. Um, 
but yeah, splay and you know basically the stance of that bipod, that how wide or narrow those legs are, uh, big deal. I think that's one of those things that it's like so important that I didn't even think of it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's I mean for, for us, it's like you just can't live without. Yeah, it. you have to have right. it. Yeah. Um, okay, so anyway, back to spike foot because basically when those legs spread out or get narrower, those big UFO-shaped rubber feet, they're getting good contact no matter where they are. It's a really soft, sticky rubber. So I found that almost no matter what you're on, those rubber feet are sticking really, really well. Um, they get good contact at all those different angles. Um, and, and they work on pretty much just about any surface out there. Now, where I would say the spike feet really shine is um, any kind of really, really loose ground um, or, you know, so I, I'd say like if you're hunting, I don't know, back east where you got like really loose, I don't know, like deep forest where you got, you know, loose pine needles and stuff like that or gravel or sand, oh, I can see them conditions. muddy. I mean, yeah. I can see them being really, really advantageous there. Um, the other thing is like snow and ice. Yep. Um, you, you know, you need, they're kind of like basket shaped, like a ski pole. Right. Um, and those spikes will give you a little bit of, a little bit of bite in the only, that kind of condition. The only times I think of wanting to have something like that has been like coyote hunting. Yeah. When yeah. it has been cold and icy sure. and stuff and you know, your feet just want to slip. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of the few circumstances, but. And, and, you know, I'll say I, I shot several NRL hunter matches this last year with the spike feet and with the other and just mm-hmm. trying to kind of get a feel for what I liked and, and didn't like. And I really never found an instant where I felt at a disadvantage with the spike feet. And there's certainly instances where they're they're nice. You can get just a little bit more bite uh, where that, that rifle might want to move on you, you know. Um, but, you know, again, a, a spike foot's not going to grab all that great on, like, rock versus a good soft rubber foot um it, it does fine but it's not necessarily the ideal like i'm talking like solid rock yeah. you know or solid surfaces they're one thing i mean you guys will learn really quick they're terrible off of a bench you do not want to don't even mess with shooting off uh spike feet off a bench let alone your your pickup truck right? yeah yeah uh, we did design that steel spike on those foot feet um, as relatively rounded. It's not a, a really sharp uh, spike like some guys are making, so it's not going to rip holes in your clothes yeah. and whatever else. Um, we we also went pretty uh, off the reservation on how we approached designing those spike feet. If you look at, I've never seen anything like them out there. Uh, you know, when you think about it, the feet on a on a bipod are always at an angle. And so guys building square, squared off spikes just, just make, doesn't make sense. So what we did is we canted those feet out to match basically the kind of baseline uh, splay position of those, those legs. And then um, so it fits really nicely at that main position. And then uh, at the narrowest position, they're kind of out on their tiptoes, kind of like a ballerina, but you're still getting two two good points of contact with a spike in the outer cup of that foot and then splayed way out. Same thing, you're getting the spike and that inner cup on that foot as points of contact. I'll have to try them. Like, yeah. that, I mean, I haven't I haven't decided that I needed them, yeah. but, like, with what you're saying, it, it all makes me more interested in yeah. trying them than I have been with any of the other bipods I have, so. No, I, I think if you put them on at the beginning of hunting season, yeah. you probably wouldn't have to bother taking them off. Right. Um, now, if you're out of the range, shooting off the bench, a couple of things like that, then you probably start thinking about, okay, maybe I want to put my... I don't even like shooting back. the rubber feet off of the... I mean, off, yeah. it, it's off better the than the spike yeah. foot, but generally I'm trying to get my feet in like gravel or yeah, 100%. dirt or something anyway. So, yeah. Best, best practice. Yeah. I, I could see how they, they are no detriment, you yeah. know, so might as well. Might as well give them a try. Give them a shot. I'll, I'll try yeah. them. Yeah, for sure. Well, anything we missed there? Um, just loading the bipod if you want to go back to yeah that. I think, and, yeah, maybe just a couple couple of pro tips we can kind of dive into. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to call this getting the most out of your bipod, and so maybe just a, a few uh, food for thought kind of things for guys that are running into the into the hills here pretty quick. And You want me to go first? Have a- uh, yeah, loading the bipod, obviously. Yeah. So... Um, 
personally, the way I do it is you don't want to overload mm-hmm. and you don't want to underload or not load it at all. Yeah. Um, and on bipod design, that was one, the first thing that I noticed when I picked up the elevate, when it was in the design phase was yeah. that there is a little bit of play in the legs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? Why are you? Why are you guys first, doing that? At first, you think, oh, it's just it's just sloppy. It's sloppy, it's, right? It's designed, but there's a design for it. And uh, once they explained it to me, it made sense. Um, you know, I've always loaded the bipod, but that little bit of movement in there actually allows a little bit of the uh, free movement of the rifle under right. recoil. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know. I mean, I think there are a lot of guys, and I've seen this out there. The one caveat I would say is, yes, we need to load the bipod. I think a lot of guys take that advice too far, and they're like pushing into the bipod. And when we say load the bipod, we're not saying you need to like put your whole body into there and push all this pressure into the bipod, because what all that's going to do is that creating all sorts of stresses that can work all the way back into the system. And and I personally think that there's potential for shifting points of impact and some yeah, things if, if you do that. Yeah. Um, and so really what we're talking about when we say load the bipod is simply um, we're, we're creating a, a small amount of forward pressure in that system, in that bipod. And so that is kind of negated with a little bit of the recoil. Right. Um, and I guess the opposite of that would be, you know, I've, I've been teaching my my 10 year old son to shoot. He's got a, a, a deer tag uh, starting here pretty quick. Been doing a little bit of shooting. Nice. And as new shooters, you kind of have this tendency to pull the gun into you mm-hmm. rather than to, to get into the gun. So there's there's kind of two ends of the spectrum. You don't want to be in either of those. But when you pull that gun into to you, what you're doing is you're loading that bipod backward because it plants and you're pulling that system into you. And what happens is now all the pressure on that those bipod feet are on the rear surface of those feet, and the recoil is going to add to that when the rifle recoils, and you're going to get muzzle jump because that, that digging motion in the rear portion of the feet, that's going to push up off the ground. So, right? yeah. I'm, I'm using all kind of hand motions yeah. here for the guys that are <laughs> listening. Um, so the the opposite of that is you put a little bit of pressure on the front forward face of those uh, bipod feet, and essentially that little bit of recoil movement um, is negated by by the pressure that you're applying there, and you get basically a very flat or minimal movement in the rifle system. So uh, you're going to have more reliable point of impact with that. Um, you're going to have less muzzle jump, which means you're going to be able to spot your impacts far better. And you're going to be able to get back on target and hope, uh, you know, execute a follow uh, follow up shot if you need. Yeah, to. see your impact. Honestly, it's just as important to know, like, all right, yeah, that one went right where I wanted it to. Right. So you don't have to worry about the fact that the animal went in the trees, right? You exactly. know, you made a good you shot. Dead, right. And I think it's important to say that it's not too much pressure. Yeah. Right. Like personally, I like to um, not use the rear bra- bag when I first get into the gun. Yeah. You know, kind of put the stock against my shoulder, yeah. settle my weight behind the gun, where if I was just let go, it would all stay together. Yeah. The, the yeah. Butt just stock enough to keep fall. it from falling. Yeah, just yeah. enough. Yeah. So, and then I, I'll bring it down, but I'm not taking my toes and digging, digging in and, and pushing in. And, yeah, you don't want to add a bunch of flex to the system. So like you said, that, wall. that play in those legs, really all you're doing is you're just taking a little bit of that play out. And so it, it's hitting that forward, that kind of, I guess, backward surface of those, the stop on those legs, yep. right? Yep. Now, there's a couple things to think about when you start, you know, it's very rare that you're getting just this awesome, perfect, flat, prone shot, right? And you might be downhill, you might be uphill, you might be side hill, uh, kind of awkward positions. And that changes a little bit how things uh, handle and the recoil is is managed, I guess. So, you know, adding on top of that, you think about, okay, um, like I mentioned before, I hunt the tops, the mountains a lot, and I'm shooting downward quite often. When you're shooting down, meaning your your bipod feet are are lower than the butt of the, the rifle, um, you got to keep in mind that 
naturally that rifle is already loading that bipod. Um, and so you really don't need to be doing much loading. It's all, you're almost letting gravity do the work to load. I mean, you still want to get in there and, and shoulder that rifle, but uh, it's it's easy to even easier to overload that bipod when you're shooting downhill. Something to think about. And the opposite's true shooting up. Opposite shoot uphill. Yeah. yeah. So make sure you're getting behind the gun and not just letting it fall back into you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's and that's where that natural tendency is to, is going to be to pull the gun into you. So you need to, you know, probably do need to dig your toes in, you know, really work in and, and get to the point where you, you can feel that you're you're kind of hitting that wall, uh, pushing that rifle up into the bipod a little bit. I think one of the other tips I would have is working on getting square behind the gun. Yes. I see that all the time. You see people showing pictures of their shooting position or whatever on a side hill. Yeah. And they're always cocked off to the side and that rifle's way out on their shoulder and now all of a sudden you're not absorbing that recoil at all, and that affects affects your point of impacts and everything point else. Point of too. impacts, and also you know you're going to get a lot of muzzle jump, and and you're typically going to see that muzzle end up one one direction left or right, uh, depending on how you're addressing it, and it's going to be a lot tougher to uh, pull off a follow up shot. You know, it's funny. I, I think back to you know, I've been here for eight eight plus years. Um, think back to some of our early uh, assets and, and graphics and stuff. And I, I even feel like I'd have to see if Nate could dig this up. I feel like we had a, a silhouette or a graphic of guys shooting, shooting prone and they're kind of cocked off to the side. Yeah. And we've, we've learned, we've learned yeah. some things over the years as well. You know, that used to feel like an, a natural way to shoot prone, but we've learned getting more square behind the rifle over the years. I think it far better came from shooting yeah. with like slings and everything right like yeah. when you're when you're supporting the rifle only with your body yeah that's the comfortable way to do it it's hard to get directly behind True. it but as soon as you go to a bipod it's uh yeah, yeah. you want to be square behind the gun body in line i think we have long range university podcasts yeah. on all this and all yeah. the yeah i guess i think i've heard it referred to as the army man pose yeah. you know it's like the old old uh, army guys you know laying kind of cockeyed yeah. behind the behind the rifle yeah the, yeah well, well yeah, I think that um, the last bullet point here is shooting from a bench, and I think it's kind of the same principle. Yeah. Just trying to get square behind. A lot of benches aren't designed to uh, to let you get square behind the gun, and you kind of have to force yourself into yeah. a position where you can. But um, I, I usually try to verify my zero prone. Yeah. Um, and if you can't, it's almost a, a modified prone where you're yeah. behind the bench. It kind of looks funny, whatever. Um, I, I'll, it's funny that you say that cause I'll, I'll do that same thing. I, I generally try to, to zero prone. Um, but it is convenient to shoot off a bench. You know, I've got a bench in my backyard that I, I shoot. It's just convenient. Yeah. Right. Um, but what I'll do is if I'm in a hurry or I'm lazy or whatever, and I, I don't want to lay down in the, the gravel there is I will literally stand behind the bench and lean, lean way, way, way forward on that gun and shoot to kind of try to to replicate that, yep. that prone, um, how you're, you know, because you're leaning way farther forward on the buttstock, like just how your body addresses that rifle, I think is, is important to try and replicate. Yeah. I think that's a good, that's a good pro tip. Like yeah. try to replicate your prone position, leaning forward. I mean, you're, you're resting the top half of your body on the bench. It's right. still very stable. Um, yeah, I think that's good. Always, good always tip. still better to, to actually go prone. Sure. You can, but you know, if it's snowy or whatever. But, sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, just a few tips for guys. Um, yeah, like I say, I think the biggest takeaway is if, if you're not carrying a, a bipod, just I, even if it's not ours, just, just do yourself a favor and go get one. Uh, get some practice behind it. I promise you it's going to, it's going to make those shots a lot, a lot easier to pull off and probably a lot more effective in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Don't disregard any other situations, but I'll take the weight penalty to make sure I have the option. Absolutely. Cool. Awesome, man. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you. Till next time, guys. If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.